everybody. Welcome to Tomb Raider Live this evening on International Women's Day. We're super excited to have you here and super excited to talk to a great panel of women from all different backgrounds, different experiences, different industries. I'm Sheree Atchison and I'm a multi-award winning diversity and inclusion leader who's been doing this work for over two decades. I'm listed as one of the UK's most influential women in technology, a two times published author, and my work is really rooted in unearthing privilege through data. My previous life, I was a software engineer, so I take a very technical view to diversity and inclusion. And today I'm really excited for us to talk about equity, to talk about what it means to support women of all different backgrounds, and actually what does International Women's Day mean to each and every one of us. We are gonna have questions at the end, so please do keep them. Please do not forget them. Write them down if you have to, um, because we have a great panel today, and I'm gonna let all of the ladies introduce themselves. So, Katie, you first. Thank you very much, Sheree. Mine is not as impressive as yours. That's that is not true. Amazing. That's, That's definitely amazing. not true. Um, so, my name's Katie Thistleton, and I'm a Radio 1 DJ. Um, before that, I was a children's TV presenter, so I was a kids' TV presenter for years. Started as a journalist. And um, now I do mostly Radio 1, but also bits of TV as well, BBC Morning Live, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm an author as well. I've written a, a children's book, which is all about mental health. And I'm training to be a counsellor. So um, I would say very much a lot of my work is, is in that world. I, um, one of my Radio 1 shows on a Sunday afternoon is called Life Hacks. That's with Vic Hope. And that's about uh, social action issues. You know, we will talk about women's issues and, and various different things. And mental health is a big focus uh, of that. So probably a lot of the work I do in the media is, is around mental health. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Hey, everyone. Hope everyone's good. My name is Stephanie Ijoma. I am an entrepreneur, especially within the gaming space. So I am CEO and founder of Naysaga, which is one of UK's leading gaming and media um, companies where we focus and champion diversity, inclusion, equity and representation within the, the gaming space. So we look after a lot of people who are, for example, black, minorities, people of colour, um, people who just felt like they weren't be able to be have seen in the gaming space. And I've been doing that for over eight years now. It is the eight year anniversary this month. So very excited. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Outside of Naysaga, um, I am CEO and co-founder of Ion Agency, which is a gaming and tech influencer marketing agency. And it is UK's first black owned uh, marketing agency. And then my other company is I am one of the co-producers and co-founders for Gigi and I, which stands for Gamer Girls Night In, which is a gaming, beauty and fashion events company where we focus on women um, and, you know, femme presenting people within those spaces, you know, coming together and merging the two. So we've worked with all your favorite brands um, across gaming, non-gaming, and my job mainly in gaming is consultancy. So I consult and ensure that you know there's diversity and, and inclusion within their product launches or campaign launches. So yeah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Karina White. Um, like these lovely ladies, I have a lot of hats um, to what I do. My nine to five is I'm an account director, um, and I essentially pair brands up with celebrity talent or influencers for their campaigns. Outside of that, I'm also a presenter cultural commentator um so i c you can normally find me on twitter airing my views <laughs> i'm sure very much to the um angst of my agents and manager and stuff um i don't hold back <laughs> um i'm also co-founder of a podcast called black mums up front um which we founded because we found that as black mothers there wasn't a space for us to discuss issues around parenting. So essentially we bring the voices of black motherhood to the forefront. Um, I'm also, you can also find me on Jeremy Vine doing the same thing, airing my views and being quite um, problematic, I would say. <laughs> you can, can tell I have a big mouth. Um, I'm also um, one of the founding members of NSPCC's Childline Circle. Um, and yeah, other than that, I am a mum to a 13 year old, which is very, very, stressful <laughs> <clears throat> hi everyone my name is kirsten ho i've been working in the cultural sector for almost uh two decades i started off as a, a dancer uh, on stage and uh slowly progressed to becoming a choreographer i ran my own dance company uh and presented works that really were inspired by uh cultural and social values uh, amongst our modern society 
And now uh, I also work for National Youth Theatre of Great Britain. It's a youth arts uh, charity providing affordable and, and free opportunities to young people across the UK and, and Northern Ireland, and uh, which are for on stage, backstage, uh, uh, off stage, on stage, all of it. Uh, and I lead on equality and diversity and inclusion at National Youth Theatre, as well as at safeguarding. And yeah, thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. Keep that mic down there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. I think we have so many different perspectives, different experiences, different places that we're all from. This year's International Women's Day theme is embracing equity. And I think it's important that we're all on the same page of what that actually means as well. When we're talking about equity here tonight, we're talking about understanding the different nuances and the different support that different groups need. In, this, in the genre or the specific area of women, we're really what we're saying is that women are not monolithic. We're saying that women of all different backgrounds, ethnicities, disabilities, neurodiversities, sexual orientations, and so on, require different levels of support. And if we don't take that support, if we try and take a one size fits all across it, we lose the nuance and we then leave people behind. So when we're talking about equity tonight, we're really talking about making sure that none of us succeed unless all of us succeed. And I guess with that in mind, folks, I would love to ask you, when we talk about equity, what key ways do you feel like we need to embrace equity, both in our daily lives and in the jobs that we do? Kirsten, you have the mic. Why don't you go first? Um, so I can speak from my own experience working in the theatre world. Uh, what's really important at the moment, we, we've progressed so much. We, we, we honestly have, but there's still so much more to be done. Um, and for us, it's about not making assumptions. It's about being proactive. Uh, and that can be, that can include inclusive language, for example. Uh, it's about reaching out and, for example, asking for access needs. You know, what can we do to support? How can we embrace? How can we, how can we break down barriers so that um, the art sector is welcoming, especially to young people? Um, at the moment, it's, it's a very challenging time. Um, cuts everywhere and and from my own personal experience I found the arts easier to access when I was younger now I have two children as well and I find it more and more difficult and it doesn't need to be just one experience just one moment can change someone's life completely and finding a way to make sure that that person can can come in and be celebrated for exactly who they are is really important yeah, Karina, please. Um, I think for me, there's different lenses that I look at equity through. Um, I would say when we're doing the podcast or I'm turning up in spaces as a black mother, for me, it's about recognizing that actually a lot of the time black women are at a disadvantage um, if they're trying to bring children into this world, especially within the healthcare system. So for those of you who don't know, um, black women are four to five times more likely to die during childbirth. For me, it's not acceptable that just because you're trying to bring a new life into this world, it means that you may actually lose your life. And I think when we look at things such as equity and we think about actually there's different um, layers to what makes us women or you know the the understanding us as women it's also understanding that there's there's lots of different factors that influence that and impact that it's you know of course your gender it's your ethnicity it's your cultural background it's about understanding all of those those factors and me as a black Jamaican woman there's things that you know I'm not disabled I'm not in a same-sex relationship but it's also understanding that there are black mothers that exist as that being their identity and making sure that we advocate for those women as well and making sure that we understand what their experiences are so when we are turning up in certain spaces and we are advocating for black women we're advocating for every mm -hmm. black woman and whatever that might look like in my nine to five I work a lot in the creator space and um, I'll tell you a story I, I started a job during lockdown um, working for one of the biggest tech brands and I looked on their social feed and it was all white creators and I was like yeah no I can't come in here as a director and put up with that so I had a very transparent conversation with um, our client and I said look when I send you over casting lists and I send you over suggestions of creators that we can use or influencers or talent they're gonna be mainly black 
I'm sorry about that because that's what I identify with. There is data that shows that black creators specifically and especially black women are underpaid and under rec recognized in the digital space. So if I can be in a position where actually I can recognize that and I can change that, then I will do that. And by the time I left that employment, the way that they recognized and they used talent and influence and creators completely changed and it was much more diverse and it was using creators from all different backgrounds not just highlighting diverse women but identifying that they need to use um, women from diverse backgrounds in terms of being inclusive people with disabilities people in same-sex relationships people with just different um, experiences to what they normally use and I think it's really important that in this room whatever role we're, we're working in or whatever spaces that we're existing in that is our chance to actually bring equity in and stand up and say actually there's small differences that we can make that's not necessarily going to shake the table but will make a big difference me personally i like to kick the table down but <laughs> i understand not everyone has that ability to be able to do that but i think it's about making those small changes in whatever places we turn up in or we exist in to try and make small changes that can actually um influence and encourage equity as well that was really good um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so coming from the gaming space um, and just you know relaying what she said um, being a black woman I'm not light-skinned I'm not you know I'm not a, I'm not in that kind of area where I have you know privilege to you know succeed and um, I speak for so many people and that kind of gives me that superpower to really kind of stand for stuff that you know includes inclusion equity diversity um, luckily what I've been doing in the space over the last eight years is that I've been able to create a community and build a community that has different voices where I'm able to gather that kind of you know information and relay that to our clients um, because unfortunately in the space that I'm in it's a very white male dominated space and Okay, it's a very white male dominated space and... A white man coming in too. <laughs> <laughs> they heard me, they heard me, they heard me, they heard me. So, um, and they only have one point of view and it's very, very important to ensure that if we're going to be doing everything, we have to do everything with 100% and that also means bringing everybody in. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, there was... Um, a um, award ceremony where Gabrielle Union and mm. the husband won um, an award and her speech really resonated with me because we can look out for our own people but it has to be for everybody it can't mm. just be selective because mm -hmm. maybe that's not something you subscribe with or that maybe that's something that's not your lifestyle but mm. if we all want to win we all have to do it together mm. and Unfortunately, I've had to deal with racism. I've had to deal with sexism. I've had to deal with colorism. But I know that there's people who um, who don't have a voice, but also want to exist in this space. Not they don't have to be in the forefront, but they may want to be able to make impact in behind the scenes, whether it's working mm -hmm. in marketing from a digital standpoint, whether it's you know working in development. And if there's somebody there to show that okay, there's somebody that's you know actually fighting for us to bring equity, because equity is not just only you know bring in diverse faces is also financially we are heavily underpaid as women you know and especially as women of color and if we're not making those actions or saying something about it it's still going to be the same system so for me how i see equity is that is you know it's breaking down those barriers it's you know having those conversations it's speaking in the rooms where we are not normally in to really open up the rooms to other people because again I may live one, you know, lifestyle, but there's other people who mm -hmm. live different. And I want to be able to use the community that I have to have those voices in those rooms. So mm -hmm. it's just that ongoing, you know, journey. But hopefully, you know, the progress that we're making in the spaces, whether it's gaming or, you know, other industries that we're in, it's not just, you know, having one point of view. It's also having different points of view to really kind of have that equity to a standpoint. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think for me, first of all, I wish people understood what equity was a little bit more. And, and I didn't know about equity until a few years ago. And, um, you know, my favourite way to explain it to people is that kind of <clears throat> analogy with the ladder or mm. the, you know, the image you get of the, the people behind the fence and yeah. someone needs to step on a 
step on a step to be as tall enough to see over that fence as everybody else. And in my experience, people really understand it when it's explained to them, but they don't know about it. Mm. And I wish there was a little bit more education um, about it, because I think maybe we've got to a place where a lot of people believe in equality, but they don't realise this next step, which is that some people actually, the, they don't understand unconscious bias because it's unconscious. <laughs> so no one knows that they've got it and they don't mm. realise that, um, that some people do need an extra sort of leg up. And I feel like sometimes we can be in a bit of a, an echo chamber and the fact that you have all come here tonight probably tells me that you're very forward thinking people that um, are perhaps in a similar echo chamber to perhaps what we are with, with very forward thinking people. But I will often, you know, if I'll be in a pub and I'll be chatting to someone and I'll, I'll challenge them if, if they bring up something. I'm very fun at parties. And... Um, <laughs> And, and it strikes me that actually a lot of people don't understand how it works. And what I find a lot working for the BBC is that um, people will come to me as, as a white person and, and say, oh, you'd probably be doing that job if you were black or you were disabled or something like that, you know, or, or, and they'll come to me and they'll say that and they'll think that I'm going to go, oh, God, yeah, isn't it terrible? PC gone mad. Um, and I'll kind of challenge them on that. And, and, it, and I become aware all the time that people get very angry about box ticking and people get very angry about people being given a leg up and I think a lot of you know uh, sort of straight white able-bodied men feel attacked because they feel like from a psychological perspective they're feeling like well if I fail at life I've got no excuse <laughs> do you know what I mean so I, I get why they feel like that from that perspective as well um, and I think there just needs to be more education on unconscious bias and more education on equity and why some people need that extra leg up because the BBC for example do brilliant schemes where um, it will be you can apply for this if you are a person of colour you can apply for this if you have a disability you can apply for this if you've not been able to access further education and those schemes are fantastic but what I see a lot you all need to look at the Daily Mail comments which unfortunately sometimes I do because I like to piss myself off um, you, won't, you need to see that for people to accuse anybody who is a woman, who is a person of colour, who has a disability. They'll, anybody who has any one of those traits will be accused of being in that position because they've ticked a box. And that is something we come across a lot. So I think we just need to bring that education about equity and unconscious bias a little bit more into the forefront and, um, and, and make it a bigger conversation. I think it's a really good sign that that is the theme of this year because that's the first time I've seen it spoken about in a, in, in a sort of big way and I think that's it's the next step isn't it you know people have maybe accepted that women shouldn't be abused but maybe they haven't expected they haven't they, they don't know about the next the next bit of that yet so I think um, that's kind of what equity means to me and I kind of thought about examples in my life because it's so broad there's only there's, there's things that we can all think of that uh, um, relate to us and for me something I've thought about a lot as a woman who is sort of approaching her mid-30s um, in the industry, bringing this back to the industries that we work in, um, is sort of maternal rights. Um, and I, that's somewhere that we're not quite at in the media industry, I don't think yet. Most of us are self-employed. I feel very much that if I were to go off and have a baby, you know, all the radio one D, the male Radio 1 DJs who've had babies, no one's even known about it. They've not left the room. I have to leave the room for a bit. <laughs> and it's something I worry about, and it's something that a lot of my friends worry about as well. And that's one area that I can give an example of that I think things need to be looked at to bring, to bring that equity um, to the right position so that, that, fe that women in the media industry feel that they can still progress in the same way that the men can if they want to have children. Absolutely. I think there's been... No, I don't need oh, that. Oh, you don't need it. I'm grabbing it. Oh, you've got a microphone. <laughs> I've got one. I just forgot, yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's so many interesting tidbits from all of what you've said. Um, I know certainly as an adopted woman of colour raised in Ireland, I don't think we have any other Irish people here today, just me. <laughs> um, but um, certainly growing up on free school meals in a very rural place where I grew up when there's a traffic jam, it's because a, a farmer is moving his cows from one field to another. <laughs> um, that's not a joke either, that genuinely happens. Every time I go back home for a wedding, we are late because there's sheep on the road. <laughs> um, but, Certainly when we talk about equity, we're talking about access to opportunities and we're talking about understanding what does access for you mean and for you and for you and all of these different things. One of the things I think gets lost so often in that conversation is accessibility around disability, around the needs and physical needs and both mental needs of disabled folks. Um, what does it mean when we run events to be accessible? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to actually create content that's accessible? I've seen so many businesses today hosting International Women's Day 
posts, etc., with no subtitles, captions, or transcripts, which is such a small, small thing to do. But if you think about it, that cuts off so many disabled folks who have those needs. And I think when we move into our next question around what International Women's Day means to us, I think for me, I wrote a Forbes piece last night in kind of a haze of this is the data that I want people to talk about. This is, especially in technology, um, one of the things I did was I led the, you, the expansion of the world's largest nonprofit globally dedicated to women in tech called Women Who Code. And the reason I chose that one or that brand was because it was free. I didn't want to create something that someone who couldn't afford a fiver couldn't go to a meetup and learn about Java or Agile or whatever it would be. And when I think of International Women's Day, I'm thinking about how can we ensure that we leave the world better for both people like us, but equally people not like us at all. You know, I do have some disabilities. I'm a woman of color from a poorer background and I'm adopted, so there's a whole mix of conflicting identities in that. Um, but I'm still very privileged and I'm both underrepresented and privileged. Two things can be true at once. And I guess for you, what does International Women's Day mean to you when you first hear that phrase? I thought about this on the train on the way here today because I thought, what do I literally, what springs to my mind when I go into National Women's Day? And the first thing that springs to my mind is, what can I do? Um, and what can I post? And social media and, and the media is where we um, access all of our information pretty much now about, about these international days and national days of awareness and where we really get a picture of how people are feeling and what people are thinking about these things. And what really strikes me with International Women's Day compared to any, any other day like this is the disparity and, and just how, how much there is. It's so diverse. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you've got people sort of posting pictures of their friends or husbands posting pictures of their wives and girlfriends saying, happy International Women's Day. You've got people in, in some cultures, they'll give gifts in China, they'll give gifts to the women in their life. I think that might be a bit of a thing in Russia as well. Um, you'll have people posting about how, um, you know, we need more female CEOs. You'll have brands saying pretty little thing, going, oh, happy International Women's Day, here's a code. I don't actually know if they've done that, they're just an example, so don't sue me. Um, but, you know, brand, brands, will, have they? I thought they would, yeah. Brand, brand, brands will be posting that kind of thing. Then on the other end of the scale, you've got people talking about giving you these horrendous statistics about violence against women, about child marriage, about, um, about the, the amount of women of colour who die in childbirth, about um, maternal health, you know. And it's so broad that it's very overwhelming. Mm. And you go, God, me posting my friend, happy International Women's Day, aren't women great? Feels <laughs> like a drop in the ocean. Mm. What can I do about all these horrific things that are happening and it can be so overwhelming that sometimes I just refrain from posting anything mm. and like on Radio 1 we've done this Radio 1 happy mix that I do every week which is great but we've done an International Women's Day version because we theme it around whatever's going on and it's Lizzo and Taylor Swift and all these you know fantastic women that have done great things to, to stand up for women um, but it feels pitiful sometimes when you look at some of the, some of the bigger things um, and I suppose when I think of International Women's Day that's what I think about I think what can we do in terms of activism what's the right way to go around it I think I think what can I actually do today mm, you know yeah, what charities yeah. can I donate to what yeah. what can I share on social media that's going to make people that's going to be a sucker punch and make people go oh my god we still need this yeah. I, I think, think one of when, when you've just said that was very ties back to what Karina what you mentioned earlier around you know small changes or small actions big impact and that's what, you, what you're saying, you know, you're not sure kind of what to do, but doing something, anything is better than nothing, of course. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you say um, about um, what to post, because I wanted to post something today and then I didn't end up posting something today because I just couldn't bother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, International Women's Day, I think, is a day, when, when I think of that, it's a day for me to really appreciate the women that I have in my life and that's probably why I couldn't bother to post because I knew I'd probably end up leaving somebody out and someone would probably get pissed off um excuse my language um but yeah for me it's around kind of appreciating the women in my life um for me my mum passed away when I was 17 and she was probably one of the most strongest women I knew she would she had cancer and she was a social work manager and she would go for chemotherapy in the morning and then in the evening in the afternoon she'd go straight into work mainly because she had bills to pay and so did my dad but also because she had people that 
like clients that she had to serve you know she was a mental health social worker and for her it was like she still wanted to show up and for me that's incredible strength like I'm in bed when I've got like a flu and I don't go to work for like four days like it's ridiculous <laughs> to have chemo and then going straight into work so and my mum was always very appreciative of the women in her life and the women that showed up for her when she was ill. And for me, it's about appreciating those women who kind of continue to carry the torch um, that my mum carried. So my aunties, my daughter, my friends, like it's about appreciating them and for them to recognize like exactly how strong they are in different ways and the contribution that they make to my life. Like everyone thinks I sit on panels and I do talks and I'm this confident person when actually a lot of the time before I'm due to go and do like Jeremy Vine or do a talk or whatever, like literally inside, I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I'm having like a mini breakdown. And it's always one of my female friends that like my best friend will text me. She'll be like, I can't be there today, but you know, you've got this, Karina, you know, you've got this, or they'll come and support me like, and be there to make sure that I'm okay. And I think for me, it's about just that one day to be able to appreciate my friends and also reflect on how they impact me and how they encourage me to show up, whether it's for them or for other people. And I think, yes, we talk about the small changes that we can make around equity and um, gender equality, um, but also it's around just small things like recognizing those people in your life that allow you to show up each and every day and I did have to do a little shout out to the guys in my office today because I made a joke this morning like so what are you lot doing to appreciate the women that you work with like and it was only a joke but um, I was telling the girls they um, one of them went and bought us breakfast from prep and at lunchtime one of them did a um, delivery order for um, five guys <laughs> and then another one went and bought um, donuts in the afternoon for like our afternoon snack and actually you know it's small things like that like and we made a joke like you're gonna go and expense this aren't you and they were like no no, no. like we do actually appreciate you so I think it's for women it's around kind of for me anyway it's around appreciating the women in my life and I think for a lot of men as well it's an education piece for them or just an opportunity for them to appreciate the women they work with the women in their lives in whatever capacity that might be I mean if donuts aren't equity I don't know what it is <laughs> on, like on, honestly, about me doing us today. I mean, I from home. honestly, International <laughs> Women's Day. I think someone else said it. International Women's Day is like your birthday for like everybody oh God, because you just you just get spoiled. You get bookings. You get people being nice to you. You get like when I was walking to work in Liverpool Street, one of the offices had like um, the num the the door number like massive yeah. like illuminated with International Women's Day. And part of me, I was like, oh my god, that's amazing. And the other part was like, I'd really love to know what your gender pay gap is in your yeah. office yeah. and whether there are actually any women yeah. in your like at exec level but yeah. that's probably a conversation for another day if, <laughs> if anybody has seen it's only specifically for the UK because it's based on the, the government UK pay gap here but there's a really good um, Twitter handle called gender pay gap oh, yes. um, yeah. and people post hashtag IWD 2023 and it goes and searches for their specific gap and then replies in a quote tweet mm. And what I saw today was quite a lot of the businesses, quite a lot of the businesses so like the Googles, the, um, the big companies that had 15% or higher pay gaps. When they got quote tweeted, they went and deleted their original tweet. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of just replying and saying, we know this exists, this is what we're doing. But anyway, yeah, it should be yeah. The best, but just, yeah, just kind of deal with it instead. But Kirsten, what about you? I know we talked about, you know, your mum and all as well at the start there, but what does international understanding uh, to you? So yeah, I, I, the same, I've been thinking about this all day today as well. Um, for me, it's about taking a moment to pause and reflect um, on, on this day, which is so important for, for us globally. And I think because I'm of a dual heritage background and because I've had an international upbringing, what I really value is the international aspect of this, how, it, how it's, it's a global um, day for all of us. and. And because obviously I'm a dancer and I, I, I very much value um, uh, so the, the, the way that we can communicate uh, without borders, with, you know, transcending borders, transcending boundaries. Um, I, I, I love that aspect of it. It's a celebration and, and especially it's, it's, it's something that's not just within the English speaking world, that it's for all of us to celebrate in our own way. Um, and also to, to find a, a moment to have positive or even just constructive conversations, mm -hmm. uh, creating a brave space where people can actually 
have these conversations without all the stuff that's going on in the world and, and to be able to connect. I mean, just being here today, this panel is, is wonderful. And as you say, it was, it's almost like our, a birthday for all. Why can't every day be like this? And how can we continue to progress so that we can really enhance the journeys for all young girls coming up? So, yeah, it's, for me, it's about that. Wonderful. And Stephanie, what about you? Um, so I think for me, honestly, it's just about giving myself grace um, and just taking a moment to just be like, you did that. Like, yeah. you know, like, you're that B-I-T-C-H. But, you know, <laughs> like, um, it, it's, it's hard being a woman, you know, no matter where you're from, whatever background, it is hard. And we have come a very long way to having no rights, to having some rights, and now having rights. Mm -hmm. And just being able to see the landscape of all women from just all different backgrounds across the world, being celebrated, but then also just looking within and just realizing what you've done as a woman yourself. Because again, peer pressure and just from a personal standpoint, like mental health and, you know, stuff like that. And I feel like it's such a really good day to just kind of reflect on what have you done for yourself? Mm. How can you give yourself grace? Because we were not, sometimes we're just, you know, there's, again, there's so much pressure within the world. And I feel like this day is such a really important day to kind of hone in and all of your achievements whether you do a nine to five whether you're creative whether you're an entrepreneur just be proud of yourself mm -hmm. and this is something I used to struggle with like you know creating a saga and the businesses I've created like I don't give myself enough grace and I don't get time to sit down and reflect on what I've done for so many people and I'm trying to do it more and you know my peers and women around me are always you know reminding me Steph like, you know what you did, you, you know what you've done for this um, space, you know what you've done for this industry. And I feel like this is the first time in a long time where I've actually just taken everything in. And I guess the other end of it is just looking at, okay, what can I do now mm. going forward to, you know, really help continue the conversations and continue to really impact lives on other women and, you know, other people and, you know, really trying to help change the conversations and, stuff like that so you know there's two ends of the spectrum but mm -hmm. I think more importantly just giving myself grace yeah. I love that I'd never actually really thought about that it being a day to maybe have a break yeah it's okay to take some break for you, you no yeah, no, <laughs> not me, no. Um, but I think there's something really interesting in what you mentioned there Stephanie around you know the other side too of um, and I always describe it as the privilege of leadership that the biggest privilege that I have is I'm listened to and um, you know when I write things people buy them or people read them. When I speak in meetings, people no longer speak over me, but instead they sit back and they listen. Mm -hmm. And that privilege of leadership, meaning that actually when we speak or when we know when we speak, for the most part, we know people will digest it before they provide a response as opposed to having already decided the response before we finish speaking. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so powerful about today and certainly the panel and so on, of being able to use that avenue that we all have in the different industries that we're in to do something meaningful for other people instead of you know taking the ladder up behind us what would be the purpose of that um, I saw the UN had shared research recently that it will take if there's no more investment in gender parity it's going to take 300 years to reach that so us pulling the ladder up behind us ultimately defeats the purpose you know what would be the point in that we're not gonna live forever I hope not um, anyway and I think with that in mind when we think of being a role model, being someone that potentially can be someone that someone aspires to, who has done great things like you've all mentioned, who have your role models been, you know, when you've, not necessarily just growing up, even now as well, and Stephanie, what about you? I know you're in the gaming industry and everything else, what about you? So, in the gaming industry, I had no one to look to but myself, yeah. and this is not something of like, having a diva moment, or, you know, being, you know, it's literally myself, I had to create an opportunity. I had to create a business from scratch because eight years ago, I actually wanted to try and enter the gaming industry, but no one was, you know, accepting me. No one was allowing me to work with them, even on a foundation level. I actually came from a health background. So I was working in health as well as creating a saga. And when I wasn't able to actually, you know, enter a gaming job or entry level gaming job, I said, you know what, let me just create the space. And here we are. And, um, when it comes to looking at role models, it's hard because you can have peers that, you know, you work with and, you know, you can look to, but ultimately I had to do everything myself and, you know, I had to be my own biggest cheerleader. Mm. Um, and especially in the industry when you don't really see people that look like yourself as mm. well, 
it's very, very hard to kind of pick out the ones that mm. are like, okay, this is somebody I can look mm. to. And I, I wish I had that. Mm. Um, but what I can say outside of gaming, my mother, um, she's always been a go-getter. She's always been able to create opportunities. Obviously, she's, you know, she's an immigrant and, you know, she came over here when she was young and built the life that she wanted to, you know, mm. to, to live. And that was that kind of constant motivation for me to build mm. the life that I wanted yeah. to live. And I feel like, you know, I'm very, very fortunate enough to be able to have the voice that I have as a leader in the space mm -hmm. to help other people to, again, when I go into rooms, the rooms are quiet because I have the voice to mm -hmm. speak for many, many other people. But building what I've done is always and will always be bigger than me because yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do this forever. Yeah. I want to. That's why I've created a team. That's so they're topic. able to do that and they're able to kind of create role models within yeah. themselves. So... To answer um, the question, I guess I'm, I, am, I am my own role model yeah. and I've been able to be role models for other women mm -hmm. and other people for the next generation. Yeah. Wonderful, so, yeah. wonderful. Kitty, what about you? I find this a really hard question to answer. <laughs> it's, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because a part of me wants to say a lot of people in my life who um, I think the reason I admire them is because they've worked so hard and it's like, oh, they've been mothers and then they've worked so hard and they've had three jobs and, and now I feel like I'm in a place in my life where I'm like, they shouldn't have had to do all that, <laughs> like, you know, and, and, and am I in a place in life where I'm admiring people working themselves into the ground? I don't, I don't know if I am, because I don't know if that's what we should be doing. Um, and I have, you know, I thought about this in regards to the industry, because I know that's what we're sort of talking about, and I've got role models. Helen Skelton, who used to do Blue Peter, mm. um, I worked with her for a bit. She was such a girl's girl. She, she wanted other women to succeed. She really made sure that on that show she was not the sidekick to a male presenter, which can happen a lot of time on TV. Um, when, you, when you're the female presenter, she's going through a really difficult time at the moment, but has also just dealt with it like a boss. Claudia Winkleman, just mm. love, because everyone hates that fringe and she doesn't care, couldn't care less. <laughs> she does not care. She's like, I will put so much eyeliner on and bad fake tan and have a fringe and I could not care less. And her book is brilliant. You finish her book and you go, I'll do whatever the hell I want. And that's, that's what Claudia Winkleman does. So I've got sort of idols in, in that sphere. But also, I actually think my best mate, um, who is younger than me, she's six years younger than me, she's, she's only 25, is my uh, is the person that changes my perspective on things the most mm. now. Um, she's done a similar route to me in that she, she was a, an, a child actress and then a, a children's TV presenter and she retrained to be a counsellor. And she's the person that has helped me challenge the views I have that aren't mine. Mm. <laughs> so the things that society has taught me that I should be like as, as a woman mm. and, and the things and the way I feel about my appearance and the way I feel about weight and the way I feel about uh, other women. And, and we will catch each other if we slag off a woman on the telly and we'll go, mm. well, that's, is that you talking <laughs> or is that society? <laughs> and, we'll, and she has, has challenged me and we challenge each other in, in really great ways like that and she's moved to Australia now and is living her best life but <laughs> she has really challenged the way I think about um, women in regards to that and how we feel about appearance and how we feel about we should how we could, should be as sexual beings all, all of that she um, and you know what gives me a lot of faith in, in a younger generation because I come across a lot of people doing Radio 1 that are her age and younger that um, also are that way and it gives yeah. me a lot of give me a lot of faith so yeah. I always think of, I always think I have to think of someone older and I'll actually no, not she's six years younger than me yeah, and I think not? she's probably been a big inspiration in terms of this wonderful Karina what about you who um it's gonna it's gonna sound really weird and I hope it doesn't sound self-centered but um my niece and my daughter are my role models and honestly I'm not one of that sometimes I really wonder how I've done a whole podcast around motherhood because I actually I'm not that mum that sits and talks about her daughter. I'm definitely the one that is out partying and she's making me like a cheese sandwich or whatever in the morning and a coffee because I'm hungover. Don't anyone call social services, she's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, my daughter and my niece. So um, my niece is three, my daughter's 13. And the reason why I say they're my role models because they are literally my sister and I and mm. we're my mum. Um, in that, so for those of you who don't know, my sister has always been like, my. she was always my role model growing up. Um, she was the first black woman to present News at 10. Um, she's had awful um, racist abuse spewed at her on social media about wearing a poppy, um, or not wearing a poppy rather. Um, and 
I, being the younger sister and the middle child, because I definitely have middle child syndrome, everybody, um, I was the one that was like wanting to jump onto social media and be like, so what did you say about my sister? So what, what, Should, do you want to go there? Um, and she was like, Karina, it's fine, leave it. Um, and when I look at the things that she's had to endure during her career and how she's handled it, I see those qualities in me and I've seen them trickle down to the next generation, my daughter and, and my niece. Mm. And my daughter in primary school was very shy. Like people would push her around and she'd come home crying. I'm like, why don't you push them back? She'd be like, no. I'm like, you, you want to stand up for yourself. And I've now created a monster because <laughs> she's now in secondary school. And I got, I'll tell you a story. I got a call from her school last week and they said, um, yes, yeah, Sarai can't return to her food tech lesson. I was like, why? And they said um, she was asked to go and wash her hands. So she did. Um, and then she went to start doing whatever they were making in food, to food tech and she coughed. So she went to go and wash her hands again. And the teacher was like, why are you going to wash your hands? And she was like, miss, I coughed in my hands. I need. She was like, go and sit back at your desk. And she was like, no, I'm going to wash my hands. And she was like, right, that's it. You're not listening. Get out of the class. So when she came in and I spoke to her about it, I was like, what happened? She was like, well, I coughed in my hands, mum, and I'm not going to go and start making food when I've coughed in my hands. Hello, like, you know, hygiene. And she was right, and she, she stood strong. She was like, I'll go and ride out the detention, mum, but at the end of the day, I'll do it again, sort of thing. And I was like, wow, you are me and Auntie Charlene, literally, like, as in, in she's got those qualities where she stands up for what's right and she will challenge people and I keep saying to her maybe in school is probably not the best way to challenge people but I kind of struggle with telling her not to challenge people but also allowing her to challenge people because for so many years women have been told not to challenge people and to know your place and to just do as you're told and so I do battle with that and I kind of look at her as a role model because I'm like Actually, at 13, if you recognize that actually you've got your own mind, um, you've got your own way of doing things, and you can articulate that, mm. that's actually really good qualities to have mm. at such a young age. And my niece, who's three, guys, it's Florence's world, and we just live in it. Like, <laughs> literally, I say this to my sister all the time, that she's literally like the next generation of those boss B-I-T-C-H's, <laughs> because she bosses me around she bosses her five-year-old brother around she bosses my sister around it's like what she wants she's like no auntie Karina, i want an orange i'll be like yeah, yeah i'll get for you in a minute no i want it now can you get up please and get my orange <laughs> and i'm like dude you're three like <laughs> i'm 37 you're three like please can you just give me a break but i think i look at them and i think if they possess half the qualities and values that my mum and my aunt and my dad instilled in my sister and I, they will literally go on to be the next generation of women that will stand up for what's right, that will use their voices to create change or to affect change. And there'll be those women that actually recognize that they are privileged in that they have a voice and they know how to use it and really stand for what's right. And I think with my daughter, I know you mentioned it earlier, um, around colorism and for those of you who don't know um, colorism is essentially where you favor lighter skinned um, people and they get jobs and things because they're lighter skinned versus darker skinned women and my daughter is dark skin and I'm lighter skinned and I remember in primary school someone said to her that's not your mum because you're really dark and your mum's light so that's not really your mum and she was really upset about that and now when I look at her now she actually champions that and she champions the fact that we are different shades of black but it doesn't make us any different in terms of what we stand for our values and she's someone who my 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 niece is mixed race and so she's very very fair with like blonde blondie brownie hair and my daughter, I sit and I hear her having conversations with my niece and my nephew. And I just know that when they're older, they're going to be forces to be reckoned mm -hmm. with because they know at these young ages kind of the, the issues that affect them, the issues that will affect people around you. Yeah, yeah, like maybe, maybe not Florence, but my daughter definitely like encourages her to um, read books mm -hmm. and know 
know about women that have darker skin and not just you know the doll the dolls that she has like my daughter encourages her to play with like the dark skin dolls mm -hmm. as opposed to white or lighter skin dolls it's things like that and i just think yeah they they are definitely going to be forces to be reckoned with and i look up to them because i think i have to keep on going so mm -hmm. that they know how important it is that they keep on going as well and, and kirsten before we go to questions you as well, oh, of course. <laughs> um, okay. uh, so professionally, I think the processes still need to be developed. I've, I've never felt that there was somebody who I could look up to who was the same as me. Uh, however, I've, it's, that's like yourselves, it's, it's kind of driven me forward even more so. I feel like you know, it's, it'll be my turn one day. And actually working a lot with, with young people within my role now, I can see how important representation is. Uh, and and so I suppose my role models have, have been, you know, the people around me, the, the, the women who have really, um, no, no matter the adversity, no matter the barrier, they've managed to overcome that hurdle and succeed. I mean, and that could be from something very personal and, and, or something pro professional, and it's been very inspiring. Uh, I think probably personally, it's it's the people within my, my family. Um, I grew up with my mom and my sister, and I had lots of aunties around me who were very supportive. I'm continually, I, I remind myself of, of the generations before me. Mm -hmm. um, my, great, my Scottish great-grandmother was illiterate, and my Chinese great-grandmother had bound feet. And I continually think about them in totally different worlds. Mm -hmm. And I have so much respect for them. And then my mom and then myself and then working in the arts feels like a complete privilege, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It's just mm -hmm. like, wow, you could do something you really wanted to do and you were passionate about it and you went for it. And uh, actually even the last piece that I did on stage was, was a tribute to, to them because I, I absolutely feel that I owe so much to them mm -hmm. for, for fighting for the rights that we have now. And it's given me so much energy and focus mm. to fight even harder for more rights for the future mm. for, for, um, for young women. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's all right. There's something very interesting in the, the you know, your, your Scottish grandmother and your Chinese. Yeah. And the, the, yeah, there's some, that's very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, one in there. Um, so I know we have some questions from Instagram. Is that what we want to do first? Or do we want to put it before? So if anybody has any questions for any of the panelists about anything whatsoever, please raise your hand or stand up. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> so let's go to Instagram first. It might warm people. Okay, cool. Um, so why is it important for men to engage in International Women's Day slash gender equality? Who wants to take that first? <laughs> Did that come from a man by any chance or? No, I think it wasn't. Yeah. Oh, re really? Oh, okay, fine. I think um, it's a fair question. <laughs> I think in any, with any form of kind of disadvantage, whether it's um, racism, sexism, whatever it might be, to really, unfortunately, to really affect meaningful change, we need allies. And with issues that affect women, unfortunately, a lot of the time, people will not sit up and take notice if you have five women sat on a panel talking about something, but they will listen to a middle-aged white man that has had his voice heard for 50-something years. And so I do think it is really important for men to get involved um, and be allies because actually same when we talk about racism it shouldn't always be on us to be the ones that raise these issues and to be talking about these issues guys i'm tired like i'm tired as a black woman we just had three years of black lives matter i'm tired about talking about race and ethnicity i'm tired of talking about the issues that we face as women now is t the time for men to show up and say actually do you know what 
you can sit down on this one. We've got you. We're going to talk about this. We're going to raise awareness about this. We're going to stand up and try and affect change on behalf of the women in our lives, for our next generation, for our daughters, or whatever it might be. I think it's very, very powerful for affecting change to have allies. And in this regard, men, you guys are our biggest allies, as long as you're not talking yeah. nonsense. I, th I think... <laughs> I, I think what's, what's really important is understanding who the pool of decision makers are. I know my work is really with a lot of big companies and industry and tech industry specifically. And if we look at who the decision makers are, the majority of those people in the tech industry are certainly men. Men from various different backgrounds, but certainly men as an overarching group as we look at it. And if we think about how we change, for example, the tech industry, the solutions that we create of tomorrow, the apps that we all use on our phones and so on, it's all about how we embed friction into decision making. Now, if the pools of people that we have in those leadership groups are predominantly men and we don't have friction in that group, then we can't make solutions that really represent society. And so that's when, we, when people ask that question, I think, you know, it's a fair question. Maybe you're not sure. I'll be, um, what's that word, I guess, optimistic that you're asking it from a good perspective. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that people recognize that we're talking about the people who have decision makers and the cross section of that in a Venn diagram, it's mostly men. So it's really key that people understand that we can't change the things that we're talking about. You know, I sit at a vice president level, so I can change quite a lot of things in my company. But if I'm the only woman of color, which I am, as a vice president in the company I work, which is a global company, that's not enough. So it's key that we have the decision makers. And again, most of those are men. Kate, do you want to answer? Yeah, Please. absolutely. I, uh, you're both right exactly in what you've said, that all marginalized groups have allies to thank for being able to get these things through because those were the people in power and the people that were mm. able to, 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 to change things. Um, so it's absolutely essential. I think that uh, men can sometimes feel they don't want to be tokenistic and they don't want to mm. be like, like pretty little thing and just stick a little tweet on saying women are great to, you know today I absolutely don't I'm not you're not an ambassador no, are you no, I'm not <laughs> you don't have a range with them do you no, 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 I no, like I've that. nothing I've nothing <laughs> well you know I, I, won't, I won't get into it but I don't have any particular beef is what I'll say They're just just a good example of a brand that might just shove out a sort of throwaway comment um, yeah but um, I think sometimes basically you can feel a little bit like are you going to put a comment out there and, and people are going to go oh god why are you jumping on the bandwagon as a, yeah. as a man do you know what I mean so I think it's more less about doing that and it's more about what can you do in your day to day work what can you do in the workplace to make sure the people that are around you the women around you are supported you know mm -hmm. it's the same as what can you do as a white person to make sure the people around you of color are supported it's less about putting out that tweet and doing the hashtags and and more about the actual action in your life and but i will also say the reason you should do it is because it benefits you too um you literally you know i've had conversations in pubs with men where they've said i'm sorry but men have it really bad you know that um it, it's mostly men who take their own lives for example and i go absolutely and i am a, a, a big um, I do a lot of awareness raising around suicide and I completely agree that male mental health is a, is a real big issue. If you wrote down every single issue that, that people list as the top things that men struggle with, you could sort it out by sorting out the women, the, the women's rights. Mm. So like the fact we're fighting against each other, the fact that, you know, men feel this pressure to be the breadwinners, men feel this pressure to be tough, men, you know, both these things go hand in hand. If we give women more rights, men have less pressure. So it's, I think that's another thing to think about. If you need a selfish reason, it benefits you yeah. too. Equality benefits absolutely everybody. There's no losers in that. And even though people sometimes think, I'm the loser, I'm not going to get the job because they're getting it over me or whatever. There's no losers in equality and equity. Mm -hmm. there's, there's only winners. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly it. The, the systems that are oppressing women and other minorities are not doing beneficial things for the most part. In those scenarios around male, male mental health, um, toxic masculinity and so we were all talking about Andrew Tate earlier and the impact that he has had on young men and certainly even young women and what that means to the next generation before we go to the, the sort of the final question Stephanie what about you what you were looking to say something um about pretty little thing well <laughs> maybe not let's not talk <laughs> I'm not a fan I'm not a fan of pretty little thing but um it's interesting because um Today, a day of meant, that's meant to be celebrating women, I was actually peeved off because I had a peer in the industry who, he might, he might even be watching this live, but um, I had a peer in this industry, okay. hi, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and 
I know people's, especially men's intentions, can come across sincere, but it's okay to also ask. We're not here to educate because there's so you can go on Google. There's books, you know. There's your colleagues that you can, you know, really get to the nitty gritty on how you can help women and how you can really come together to support women. Because again, like you both said, it is the men who, you know, get the voices out more, and unfortunately, they are listened to more. Now, the peer that I had. Um, he wanted to celebrate the women in the space who are leading, you know, in gaming. And um, he did like a shout out on Twitter. And um, in the shout out, he had four pictures and um, had a white woman, it had a light skin, two light skinned black women and myself. And when it came to me, it was, it was just literally a screenshot from my company with a celebrity that I was with. And it really annoyed me because you as a man, you're going to have eyes a lot of the time. Men are always going to have eyes more than women when it comes to being vocal or posting something. And um, again, we, I'm at a disadvantage anyways with what I do. But he could have, for example, he could have asked before celebrating me or posting me. And I, it felt like I was an afterthought because he had a very curated way of posting the other women. Like they had all individual shots. They were great, you know, HD, 4K, everything. And it was just me with a screenshot from my company account with a celebrity of a man when it's meant to be International Women's Day and you're posting it with me with a man. And I say all of the, Just throwing me, just don't do it, you know? And I say all of this to say, it's okay to ask and it's okay to understand or it's okay to um, not be as well informed because this is where we open the floor now for men to understand what can you do to help and support women whether it's celebrating them whether it's you know giving them a shout out whether it's you know talking in the rooms you know to companies and you know putting them on and stuff like that and it was very disheartening because we still have a long way to go because mm -hmm. of how he treated me compared to the other women and what I had to do is I had to go send him an angry, angry voice note, which I hope he's, you know, listened to. But um, it's stuff like that where it's just like, I really want men to not feel like they know everything because you don't. And especially when you're in these executive positions um, and when you look at it in the landscape, you all have one perspective, one point of view. And it's so important to have women um, in these rooms because they add, I don't want to say like a feminine touch, but they add a different lens to really kind of change a product launch or a campaign launch you know when something is so hard-headed sometimes you can or you can already tell that okay it's just all men that you know thought of that idea but when there's that you know little spin to a woman a woman being there and being able to really help change that landscape and that view it's again it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to you know work together by just being more open into saying I don't have all the answers I know this is where a woman's touch and a woman's expertise can come in. Let's have that conversation. Let's come together. So, yeah, like, I, I, it's so important. And I feel like, again, I think just, it's just important to listen. That's, that's the most important, you know, that's the really important, the agree thing. Perfect. So I, I know we're just about to run out. Do we, we quickly do the final, yeah, we'll do the final question. Um, so you've kind of touched on brands kind of using this day to, you know, spread this message but how do you think brands could um you know start to implement the international women's day message all year round Kirsten. Mm. content in <laughs> in the arts um who is producing content who is fund who is funding that content and i think that that is really important because we need access to greater funding because it needs to be of a, of a higher, of a standard that we can present. And it's, this is constant financial battle for us. And how do we continue to progress? How can we put on, I'm thinking about the arts here. I'm thinking about stage and, and film and, and telly. If we could have more diversity within teams that produce content, I, I believe that we could evoke change because we are, we are inheriting this you know, it's, it's, it's established, isn't it? This, the way that procedures are, policies are, we're, we're born with it, we're raised with it, and we're like, okay, this is fine, but how can we change it? And I, I believe that if brands could really start to 
think about how they conduct themselves, who is in their team, how do they finance these things, and how do they encourage young people to come into it with a fresh voice, something new. That, and, and in particular, you know, from my background, it's not, not stereotypical. You know, let's, let's, let's take away that. And let's really, let's really look at ourselves of who we are today as a modern society, something that truly represents who we are and our core values. Um, when I think of the brands that I work with, um, there are quite a lot of women that work at, at work at brands. But when we, like you said, in terms of decision making, like senior levels, there isn't that much gender diversity or ethnic diversity or inclusion. And I think with brands, I'm really keen that this isn't a tick box exercise, like when they were posting black squares on when it was Black Lives Matter and then two months later, nothing's really changed in their boardroom or at their senior leadership level or even junior levels. So for me, I'm really like, I'm always really curious when brands celebrate these these in these days these awareness days because sometimes behind the scenes it's n it, it it it's not replicated mm -hmm. so i think for me it's not necessarily about what they can do all year round for women it's what can they do all year round to be an inclusive company to work for to be an inclusive company or an inclusive brand to buy from and to purchase from you know there's, there's a wealth of data out there that now a lot of consumers are very conscious about um, brands that they purchase for they want purchase from they want to purchase from brands that are sustainable they want to purchase from brands that um, demonstrate gender um, equality or gender parity and I think it's about getting all of your ducks in a row internally first and actually having those really tough and difficult conversations around actually what is the state of our company at the moment what is the state of our branding what does our brand say but like reflect us as the kind of company that that we are and i think it's about them really looking internally first and then looking outwardly and not just doing stuff to tick a box or to um, fall in line with the latest international day. It's about making sure that your ducks are in a row mm. all year round. And I think a lot of companies mm. struggle with that, like massively. Yeah. I, th I think there's a real difference in being proactive versus reactive. And what we've seen in a lot of the, certainly most of the companies that I've worked with and everything else is that people, when something really bad happens or something um, that influences society is people try and respond like this but actually that doesn't make sense because it's not sustainable it doesn't scale budgets don't scale like that either technology doesn't scale like that and it's really important about how you think about the micro decisions that make up the big decision as opposed to just trying to change everything all at once which actually just doesn't make sense from a business perspective you know you can't change things overnight it won't happen but it's about those smaller things that you change that have the ability to then make those bigger decisions. Um, very quickly, before we wrap up, Stephanie or Kitty, is there anything you want to add? Very, very short, but hire us. Hire the people that you know, you know that you can't do the job. Um, my main job, again, is consulting. So I work with you know, some of the biggest brands in the world to ensure that what they're doing is diverse, it's inclusive. They're including everyone, not just me you know, people who, who look like, you know, you and other people. Because, again, in order for the companies to grow, in order for the brands to grow and be progressive, you have to do the work, not just from the forefront, but inside as well. So look at your HR, like, what is going on there? You know, what kind of schemes are you running for the younger generation? Because you can't have people working there forever. You know, how are we going to be able to get more people who are innovative and you know, have fresh mindsets in these companies to really change the landscape of things. But then also making sure that when you're hiring consultants that, you know, you're hiring them for the long haul, not just something that's just going to be here and now. Because I know a lot of brands are now doing things because it's what's like trending or what's happening now. But what can you do that's long term that isn't just, you know, for just for the now, you know? So I think that's, that's it for me. Kitty, anything yeah, add? I would just say the same thing you've all said, really. It's, it comes from the inside out, you know, mm -hmm. make the culture diverse and, and make sure that you're giving people um, that need it that extra bit of support and you're embracing equity and that oozes out from, from the inside out. Everything else will, 
will follow and I think that's about it starts at a top level and it needs to be that managers are educated they need to know about what equity is they need to be making sure the staff that need it have got that support and then the rest will, will, uh, will happen. Wonderful well thank you so much for spending your International Women's Day with us at Tomb Raider Live and thank you so much to our wonderful panel for all of the insights for all of the insights, the conversations, and all of the different tidbits that you've given people. I know there's some drinks here after if anybody wants to network and chat, um, but I hope you have a great rest of day and a safe trip home as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.